We have reached a new age in the history of the Dark Knight, my fellow Batmaniacs. This episode etched into history the beginning of the new Batman adventures. Before we talk about Holiday Nights itself, I think we need to set the table for this seismic shift. Our beloved Batman the Animated Series stopped production in 1994 after two wonderful seasons and 85 game-changing episodes. Almost immediately after its cancellation at Fox Kids, most of the production team continued on to develop Superman the Animated Series for Kids WB. Notable exceptions were BTAS co-creator Eric Radomski and director Kevin Altieri, among others. Altieri did get a nice shout-out in Holiday Nights, by the way. Altieri fades back, looking for an opening. The Superman show debuted in September of 1996 with the Bruce Timm design style streamlined and adapted to fit the tone they went on to explore. According to the book Batman Animated, written by Paul Dini, that same year, Warner Brothers approached the team about making a direct-to-video Batman animated film to tie into 1997's theatrical release, Batman and Robin. They wanted the dynamic duo to face off against one of the villains featured in the upcoming live-action effort. So, after a turned-down Bane story, director Boyd Kirkland and writer-producer Randy Rogel focused on Mr. Freeze, and the Sub-Zero movie was born. An important storyline in this film relates directly to Holiday Night, so we'll come back to that later. The 1997 scheduled release for the second BTAS movie was delayed to the following year, possibly because of the bad reception Batman and Robin received. We had to wait a while to see that film, but in 1996, the decision was made to create more Batman episodes to coincide with reruns of BTAS that started to air on Kids WB, and also, again, to help synergize with the BNR movie. Warner wanted a particular focus on Batgirl, who was being built up in live action at the time, along with a stronger emphasis on the other characters who surrounded the Caped Crusader. While simultaneously producing the Superman series, the crew were drawn back into Gotham for more late nights and intrigue. But this time, Gotham and its inhabitants were going to look quite different. Paul Dini mentions in Batman Animated that Bruce Timm wasn't content keeping the same design as the original run, so he altered the look of everything. Less line work, less detail, and more stylized. This made the characters look closer to the ones in Superman, which of course helped on the episodes that crossed them over. Notably, Gotham itself was given a red night sky to create the feeling of an urban hellscape. Next came naming the show. Deciding to set it apart from the first series, they originally came up with Gotham Knights. That name has been used for several Batman-related projects since, including the recent video game, but ultimately, it lost out to the more obvious new Batman adventures. So how did I feel back then, and how do I feel now about these alterations? Well. My opinion really hasn't changed much since the late 90s slash early 2000s. We had some incredible episodes come from this time period, and the voice acting was almost always as good as ever, but sometimes there was a noticeable difference in quality. Not every episode of the first batch were home runs, but you could usually at least rely on the atmosphere to satisfy and not be disappointed. TNBA didn't always achieve that base standard. I don't have a major issue with the redesigned environment, I even kind of like that blood red sky aesthetic, but some of the characters' new looks still irk me. I'll address them specifically as they come up throughout the rest of the month. There's actually a lot to dive into about that in the premiere episode here. Taking place about two to three years after the second season of Batman the Animated Series, Holiday Nights is divided into three separate stories, with an epilogue at the end. Part 1 begins on December 22nd, which sees Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy hatch a scheme to kidnap Bruce Wayne. At a local Upper Crust party, Ivy kisses him with lipstick containing a mind-controlling agent. Against his will, the pair then take Wayne on a massively expensive shopping spree, where he's forced to pick up the tab. Eventually, Bruce is able to put some distance between him and the criminals as Batman emerges to stop them. Poison Ivy was among the most drastic of the redesigns. Her femme fatale look was completely disposed of in favor of a much smaller build with dead white skin, black lips, and darker red hair. In Batman Animated, Paul Dini explained Bruce Timm's reasoning for this significant revamp. Quote, Displeased with the way Ivy was animated in shows like Eternal Youth, as a busty Amazon who could have flattened Batman just by turning around, Bruce reworked her into the small but deadly nymph-like being we had imagined all along." End quote. 
I rewatched a few scenes from Eternal Youth for reference, and while this is an obvious over exaggeration, the original design of Ivy really worked best in her first appearance, Pretty Poison, and her vignette in the classic Almost Got Him episode. That design was created for stories with those kinds of tones, and seeing it in other environments didn't always serve the character well. So I get Tim's point. This Ivy is sleeker, more undead looking, and threatening. I can appreciate that. What I think does not work as well with the redesign is Diane Pershing's voice. She was cast to fit the previous look and matched it perfectly. While her delivery is always great, I think recasting her voice to fit the new model may have been beneficial. After all, this may not be the original Poison Ivy anyway. Check out my review of House and Garden to be reminded of the comic book that suggested the real Ivy never appeared in the new Batman Adventures. I believe this is the first time we saw her use a mind-controlling kiss in this continuity. All the other times she did it, it was to kill or poison somebody. The first one that comes to mind is her debut story with Harvey Dent. She does mind-control people in the comics, of course. The best example that springs forth for me is in Batman Hush. Batman's new appearance isn't really that new. Yes, he's more smoothed out like the rest of the show, but the all-black cape and cowl and large bat logo on his chest is vintage stuff. We had even seen a similar look in the Season 1 episode, Robin's Reckoning Part 2. I'm partial to the original design and even the further developed one from Justice League myself. It's just always nice to have that dark blue highlight on the cowl and some yellow around the bat symbol, but this is a nice look. Bruce's redesign was a tad more noticeable. Gone was the chocolate and mustard suit with loosely combed hair and black eyes, dark suits, slicked back hair, sharp lines, and piercing bright blue eyes were in its place. I'm not a big fan of this overhaul. There's just not enough detail there for me. And I know that's the point, but I could have used something to distinguish him from any other handsome male. Justice League returned his black eyes, which I like way more. Besides getting one-upped out of costume and losing control of his own body for a bit, there's nothing out of the ordinary happening with Bruce or Batman here. Although, Harley and Ivy proved a force to be reckoned with, both psychologically and physically. Veronica Vreeland makes a small appearance with the new design as well. She's not a huge presence on the show, but she's recurring enough to be mentionable. Vreeland doesn't look too much different from before, just less detailed. Same with Harley Quinn. Nothing major was adjusted in or out of costume. It is kind of sad to see that Harley had regressed as a character, though. They traded in the work they did in episodes like Harley's Holiday and Harley Quinnade for shortcuts to buddy comedy and casual mentions of murder. We... we killed him! Oh well. We were going to do it anyway. We got his credit cards, what's to worry? It's cool to see her back with Ivy. I mean, the first big show together was an influential all-timer, and who knows, maybe she's been kissed and is under Ivy's control too, but as is, Harley's arc turning backwards made the fresh Quinn seem a bit hollow. An episode of her falling back to the dark side for real would have been nice. Since we've jumped ahead a few years from the last time we saw her though, I suppose that gap could be a fine enough avenue to explain this away. Overall, this segment was okay, nothing great, but man, that fashion show montage goes on for way too long. Ah! <laughs> Part 2 starts on Christmas Eve at Mayfield Shopping Center. Barbara Gordon is picking up a last-minute Christmas gift as Harvey Bullock and Renee Montoya perform undercover duties to hopefully spot a recent serial shoplifter. They seem to find their culprits in a quartet of kids, but the children in question turn out to be manifestations of Clayface in disguise. He attacks the cops and commences destroying the store when Barbara jumps into action as Batgirl. The trio of crime fighters then battle it out with the resurrected Matt Hagen. They explain Clayface's comeback in a show down the road, so fear not, his survival after Mudslide is explained then. Here, we catch a little preview of some abilities we haven't seen him fully use yet. Did I mention it's always great to have Ron Perlman back? Oh! The Clayface theme is one of my favorites, so to hear Shirley Walker play that again got me more into his reveal, too. The redesign on Hagen was just a simpler and darker redo. I will say the animation team was clearly trying, yet the detail that used to go into his transformations is sadly lacking. Going from this to this is a bit of a letdown. I loved Bullock and Montoya here as Santa and his elf. Great chemistry as usual, and Bullock especially had a few moments to shine. Yeah, you big fry baby. <laughs> Next! You're 
not the real Santa Claus. Sure I am. Want to see my gun? Ow! Poor kid. I sent her old man up the river three months ago. Here, kid. Buy yourself something nice. Thank you, Santa. Don't waste your ammo on him. Shoot the Santa. You wouldn't. Not you, dope. However, he does look like Jabba the Claws sitting there in his redesigned dimensions. While I always liked Melissa Gilbert, Tara Strong is the most recognizable voice of Batgirl to me. It was great to hear her in the role. I love Batgirl's redesigned costume as well. This was possibly the biggest improvement. The gray and blue Batman clone was okay, but all black with yellow and blue accents is so much more striking. It was also exciting to see her help take down a big villain like Clayface without Batman or Dick Grayson's Robin. This little story was a big win for Batgirl. Once you two are out of the way, ain't gonna be no one to stop me. Don't bet on it, gruesome. Part 3 happens on New Year's Eve. Joker threatens to ring in January 1st with mass murder. After a menacing new warning on TV, he kills Dr. John Erickson, a pioneer in sonic research, and steals a new super weapon he was working on, a sonic bomb that releases waves of hypersound that can kill anyone within earshot, unless they're wearing special ear mufflers. Joker hijacks the New Year's countdown at Gotham Square, where he plans to set off the bomb. Batman and Robin have to navigate a Joker-masked, crowded downtown to halt the Clown Prince of Crime's latest atrocity. Joker's redesign is bad. We all know it. We've all said it a thousand times. The weird white eyes sunken into black triangles, no red lips. It is worth noting that in some of the original art models, he did at least have the red lips, but they were removed in the series for reasons. This is another design that Justice League and Return of the Joker brought back around and improved, making him look like more of a clown again than a demonic mind. But whatever, Mark Hamill is still in there and kills it as usual, literally this time. Yeah, the sensors at Kids WB were looser than the ones at Fox Kids, so they could show images like this and actually say they were dead. The fights also seem to be a bit more intense, with punches and kicks landing in full view. Putting younger characters in more danger wasn't an issue either, which brings us to the new Robin. This is the first appearance of Tim Drake's Boy Wonder in the DCAU. We didn't know much about him yet, and he's never seen out of costume. However, we would get some background on him soon. In Holiday Nights, he comes off as a more eager and curious Robin than Dick Grayson usually did. I like his design without the green in the suit, and while he comes off as more playful, he's still taken seriously in a fight. Commissioner Gordon looks older and more worn down. I thought that was appropriate. He's been doing this for a long time, and just seems like he's going to go until the wheels fall off. Thank goodness they kept Bob Hastings around. He's great, as usual, in the role. Batman and Robin end up stopping the Joker just in time as Gotham's New Year's bell falls and cracks on top of him. The countdown is pretty tense, with Batman just barely shorting out the bomb mechanism as he's shot in the shoulder. It's kind of odd how all the attendees in the crowd willingly put on Joker masks before midnight, making him hard to locate. Maybe they didn't think those were Joker faces. I wouldn't blame them. Finally, at 1.55 a.m. on January 1st, Commissioner Gordon heads into a cleared-out diner where Batman meets him. They share their annual cup of coffee together, celebrating another year of survival. The Dark Knight lays down money for the drinks and disappears as usual, leaving Gordon to head out into Gotham's snowy streets as the full story concludes. What a cool little bookend to these tales. I dig the idea that these guys just sit down and talk for a few minutes every year. The relationship is very complicated, so making it simple for a moment or two brings some believability to the characters. Oh, and I knew Bruce Tim was one of the drunk guys at the bar, but I wasn't sure of the other two. Apparently, they're character designers Glenn Mirakami and Shane Glines. Nice. Dan Reba directed Holiday Nights with Paul Dini writing. Can't go wrong with those two kicking off a new season. It's based on the Batman Adventures Holiday Special comic from 1994, and there are a few differences from page to screen. The biggest being the omission of a Mr. Freeze story called White Christmas. I've read it, and it's a well-done, sad piece, typical of Mr. Freeze. They did not include it here for some murky reasons. Apparently, Bruce Timm didn't know that Boyd Kirkland and Randy Rogel's story for the Sub-Zero movie involved a living Nora Freeze as he was busy on the Superman show at the time. As far as Tim was concerned, Nora was dead, which is why he wanted to adapt White Christmas, since it involved Victor grieving his wife. Because of this discrepancy, they kept the story out of Holiday Nights, and considering where we left off with Victor and Nora in Deep Freeze, plus where they went with the Sub-Zero film, 
I can see why. Even if you set this between Deep Freeze and Sub-Zero, it wouldn't make sense. Freeze is off in the Arctic somewhere with his wife's, I think, still alive body, right? In any case, it would have been a poignant segment to see adapted, even outside of canon. On a final visual note, the lack of title cards is a bummer. Regardless of these changes, good and bad, this show still had a lot to give, and we're going to finish covering every last bit of it together, Batmaniacs. See you next time for a new Batman adventure. Batman and Rhonda Rhonda Batman and Rhonda <laughs>